I'm gonna have to get back on. Uh, Hamp, are you gonna say anything else before I start? Are you just, or am I ready to start any, at any time? What? Yeah, you're good to go. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is a very beautiful Sunday morning in the DMV area, and uh, it's uh, quite cold, a little below freezing, about around 30 degrees, but it's still a beautiful day because this is a day that the Lord has made. But we're just going to rejoice and be glad in it. We are not in our church building in the sanctuary, but we are the church, so we're just having a great time anyway. We're going to have a great time today, as we always do, as we uh, praise our great God and learn from him as we move along with his word. Before we get started, Pastor Melinda is going to come in with Church Life and give us some information on what's going on, what's happening, and updates and that kind of thing. So, Pastor Melinda, can you grace us with your presence, please? <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Tom. Good morning, family. Uh, welcome to Church Life. Welcome to those of you who are on Zoom, YouTube, Facebook, or who are streaming live on our website. Uh, we are so blessed and honored to have you with us this morning. I'd like to start with a praise report uh, from Esther Hill. And she says, good morning. I would like to give a praise report. God is working on me. I am able to keep my food down most of the time, still working on it. Thank you, Pastor Garrett, for the word of hope. I love it. I have hope that one day I will see my loved ones again. God is so good. He never gave up on me. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. Please continue to pray for my family. Thank you also, Pastor Russell. I listen to the church on my phone on my lunch break. Uh, thanks again, and God bless. Special thanks to Mrs. Joanne Haywood for checking on me. So that's wonderful praise report uh, from Esther. Please continue to remember her uh, in your prayers. We do have a new prayer request uh, from Deborah DeSasso, and she requests prayers for a surgical procedure she will have on Friday, January 28th. Please pray for her complete healing and recovery uh, and pray that our loving Father God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit guide everyone involved in the procedure, especially the surgeon, the nurses, and the anesthesiologist. Pray also for traveling mercies to and from the surgical center. Thank you, FOCC congregation. So please remember Deborah as well uh, in your prayers this week, we do have some new prayer updates. Uh, the first one is regarding Pastor Tom, and it says, Pastor Tom begins his treatment for myeloma on Monday and is scheduled to, for two or three cycles. Each cycle lasts four weeks, and the exact amount of time of the treatment will be determined by how his body responds to the treatment. Actual radiation is not considered necessary at this time. Praise God for that. Please remember Pastor Tom and the family in your prayers. So please, please do that as well, family. I hope that you're writing all of this down so that we can remember throughout the week to pray for our sisters and brothers. Also, Jan Logan's brother, Jimmy Jr., has been released from the hospital after suffering a mini stroke. He was able to attend his wife's, Christina McLeod's funeral and is recovering at home. Please keep the family in your prayers. Also, we have an update uh, from Chris McGill regarding her mother, um, her mom, Vera, um, Vera Payton, uh, and it says, Red and white blood counts are low, so treatment was postponed until January 28th. She is experiencing some pain and other side effects. Please also pray that when we have her labs rechecked on January 26th, that her blood counts will be normal and she will be able to resume her treatment schedule. A chest 
um, abdominal pelvic CT scan is scheduled for the 9th to review progress from the treatment. However, we praise God because we still see him at work. Mom's two cancer markers continue to drop. In November, the CEA was 56.1. Now it's 22.5. The CA19-9 was 4301.5. Now it's 742. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm going to praise God. Hope you're clapping at home as well. Um, the medical staff even celebrate the big drops in the numbers uh, in a short amount of time. Praise God. He is so good. Mom completed the radiation treatments on her spine. So uh, that is a wonderful um, prayer update. Please continue um, to pray for uh, Vera Payton as well. As well as Chris, she has an update on herself. She says, I'm still having problems from the hiatal hernia. The doctor has ordered additional tests that I will schedule around mom's appointment. Thank you, FOCC, for your prayers. So as I said, please remember all of those uh, that I've mentioned in your prayers this week. Under general announcements, uh, calling post messages. Please let Pastor Lloyd or pa Pastor Melinda know if you have not been receiving the round robin or calling post messages. The message will now show up as FOCC on your caller ID, and the phone number is 301-248-0000, which is the church's phone number. Please add this to your contacts on your phone. Also, church service on Zoom. Please let Pastor Melinda or Pastor Lloyd uh, know if you wish to be a part of the church service on Zoom each week. We will send you the link by email. Today's sermon is entitled, God's Blessing on the Saved and Unsaved, Part 1, which will be given to us by Pastor Tom Logan. Thank you, Pastor Melinda. Please try to remember all of those that uh, Pastor Melinda had been talking about in church life, those uh, who are uh, ill, those who are in need of help, those who are sick, and uh, we know that we can go to our great God for all that is necessary uh, for us to live a prosperous and productive life. In fact, he is the only source. We're going to open up with prayer now, so if you'll bow your heads with me, let us pray for our services here today. Father in heaven, we are thankful that you blessed us, that we could convene together today in the name of Jesus. We are just so grateful that you've authorized us and teach us how to serve you, Lord, and how to glorify you. And we just thank you so much for the opportunity to do this in spite of a lot of the uh, abnormalities and inconveniences that we have experienced as a result of the uh, ongoing pandemic. You still provide for us, Lord, by means of social media where we can reach out to each other and get the word out to each other and learn from each other and fellowship with each other uh, through social media platforms. We ask your blessings on this message today, Lord. We ask that you will help this message to exalt the name of Jesus Christ and glorify God throughout. We ask that you will help all of us to learn, grow, and benefit from what's being said here today and help us to take this message into our heart, Lord, and use it to be a blessing to others. We pray that you'll bless the audio, the video, the entire transmission that uh, it will go forth with might and power according to your will. We pray that you will remove me out of the way and that you will speak directly, Lord, through me to all of your people and include me as well. So we just thank you now. We give you all honor, glory, and praise. We do it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And we say amen. Now then, uh, when we think of uh, Christianity, we always think of Jesus Christ because this is whom we should think of. Jesus is the one that started Christianity, and without Jesus, there would be no Christianity. We also think about praising and worshiping. We think about sermons. We think about Bible studies. 
But we also think about uh, all the blessings that God has given us and indeed is giving us. We think about the trials and tribulations that he's brought us through and how he's blessing us now. But when we think of these things, we normally think of uh, other Christians receiving these blessings. We are Christians and we think of them in terms of other Christians receiving blessings. But we rarely, if ever, think of people who are not Christians receiving blessings. And indeed, some of us believe that God only bless Christians. But this is not who God is. This is not really true. We know that the Bible tells us that God is love, uh, 1 John 4, 8. And so he loves everybody, those who are saved and those who are unsaved. So what we want to cover here today in this message is uh, how God bless everybody in the universe, all of us people, uh, the saved and the unsaved, regardless of uh, what religion they're in, the blessings that we receive from them. You'll see how he uses church and he used other Christians to do just that, to bring blessings to different people throughout the world. Uh, we could go all the way back to the book of Genesis. And when we go back that far, we read where God gave a promise to Abraham. He made a covenant with Abraham. And one of the things that he said was that he would make Abraham a blessing. There were several things that he mentioned there, but when he brought them out to Abraham, when we read these scriptures about Abraham, we usually apply them to uh, the blessings coming through Abraham as being Jesus Christ. But there's only one interpretation in scripture or to the various verses in the Bible, but there are several applications. There could be more than one application. And we want to show you how uh, God has blessed us, not only through uh, the promise of Abraham and through Jesus Christ, which he did, but Jesus Christ blessed us in another way other than being saved. So uh, let's read the scripture first and let's just continue to narrate on it. Um, it's found in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. And uh, we begin in verse 1. It's Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. So let us read through this and, and talk about it a little bit. This is Abraham writing to uh, writing around 1500 BC. That was about 3,500 years ago. And uh, here's what he wrote. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. So God is telling Abraham, I want you to leave from where you were brought up, where you grew up. Get away from your father. His father was Terah, and they lived in the land of Ur. And God told him, I want you to get out of that land. I'm, I'm going to give you a land that I'm going to show you. I want you to be in the land. That land of Ur is uh, Mesopotamia, is what we uh, call today, uh, that would be most of Iraq and uh, most of uh, Kuwait, but all of Syria, all of Turkey, that whole area in there is, uh, is, is the land of Ur. And that's where Abraham was brought up. So God told him, look, I want you to move from here. I, I'm going to move you to another part of the land. He said, I will make you a great nation. Verse 2, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. So this is really a, a covenant that God made with Abraham. It's usually referred to in theology as the Abrahamic covenant or Abram covenant. And uh, a covenant is similar to a contract, what we would call a contract today. A contract is a legal agreement between two or more parties and uh, it's binding, they agree to do something or to not do something, uh, and it's legally binding because they both sign it. That's a contract. Well, a covenant is the same, but it has one major difference, and that is in a covenant, God is one of the parties to the co contract, God himself. So we know with God being the party, uh, we got no problem there. We know that part of the contract is going to be completed, and God is uh, one of the problems. Now, we look at one of the uh, parties in, in that covenant. Now, when we look at the covenant, we look at this, this verse, and we see that God made three main promises to Abraham in it. He said, I'll, I'll give to you land, I'm going to make you a great nation, and I'm going to bless the world because 
I'm going to bless the world through you. And he's doing this because of Abraham's obedience, of course. He can bless all the families of the earth through Abraham. Uh, now, when we read this, we know that Jesus Christ is that great blessing that God gives because Jesus Christ came through that line. Abraham had a son, Isaac. Isaac had a son, Jacob. Jacob had 12 boys. One of those boys' his name was Judah. And we come right on down the line to King uh, David, King Solomon, and right on down to Mary and Jesus. So Jesus came right down that line. Jesus himself was a Jew. And he came right down that line. And we know those blessings come from Jesus. And we can look at the blessing. Jesus made it possible for all of us, for all of mankind, to have a relationship with God the Father, to be reestablished to God the Father after Adam and Eve had sinned. So Jesus made that possible. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever will believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. In John 3.16, of course, we are all very well familiar with that verse. So we know then that Jesus Christ was the blessing. And we look at that blessing of salvation uh, through Jesus Christ. But there's another area here that we need to look at what Jesus Christ did. It was not just salvation that Jesus brought. He brought something else with him. Uh, if you look at the last part of verse 3, he said, And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So then, all the families of the earth have access to Jesus. If they would accept his atoning sacrifice, they could be reconciled to God. But he blessed them in other ways as well. And uh, when he said all the families of the earth, he's not just talking about those who are followers of Jesus Christ. He is also talking about those who are not followers of Jesus Christ, not for salvation. You have to be saved. So you might ask the question, well, how are they going to be blessed if they're not saved? If they, they, they didn't accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, what kind of blessings are they going to get from him? Well, we know that he said all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. So they have to have some kind of blessing. And he's talking about people, and it doesn't matter what religion they're in. They could be in Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, Judah, or whatever religion they're in, they're going to be blessed. Now, how are they going to be blessed? Well, we're going to go through that, and that's primarily what we're talking about today. It's still coming through Jesus Christ, but it's coming from other, uh, in other ways than just salvation. Now, Here's why this is important to understand and know. You may have children or grandchildren or friends or relatives or co-workers or fellow students, and they may have a, a, a sort of cavalier attitude toward Christianity or indifference to Christianity, or they may be um, sort of nonchalant toward Christianity. They see Christianity, they say, well, those are Christians. They are Christian because they want to go to heaven when they die. They believe they'll go to heaven. And I can understand that, and that's good if that's what they want. That's not for me right now. Maybe I'll look at it later. Maybe I'll consider it later. Right now, I want to live my life. Well, here's what, what you would point out to them. The life they're living is because of Christianity. What they don't understand is that that car they're driving is because of Christianity. If they have a wife, that wife they have is because of Christianity. It's because of Jesus Christ. And, and, and this is what uh, they don't understand. So we could tell them this kind of thing and show them the life they're living, the confidences, the comforts, the conveniences, uh, the uh, all of the benefits they're getting in life, all the support they're getting, the education that they receive, the work on the job, the position they have on their job, all of that's because of Christ, not just salvation. So they're being blessed and don't even know it. The fact that they could sit and tell us that they are... Uh, uh, you know, they, they, they're going to live their life. They don't want nothing to do with the Christian faith and all of that, or they kind of nonchalant about the Christian faith that, you know, uh, that's, uh, they're doing that, but they don't realize that they're doing it because of Christianity. Christianity is the one. Now, let's look at some of the ways this has come about. Jesus said he came that they may have life and have it more abundantly, John 10 and verse 10. Now, when he was talking about that, he's not talking about only talking about when we get into the kingdom, into the fullness of the kingdom, he's also talking about here on earth right now, have life more abundantly. And when Jesus came, he taught us moral laws. He gave us spiritual laws, which are found in the scriptures, those laws that we are to live by as we go through the sanctification stage of salvation, building spiritual character, preparing us to bring us into eternity with him. Those are the spiritual laws. But he also gave us moral laws. And the moral laws is for everybody, whether you're Christians or not. And a lot of people 
when a Christian keeps the spiritual law, the Christian is also keeping automatically keeping the moral law. So people see us keeping these moral laws. They see us treat, treating our brother and our fellow man as uh, with decency and respect and love, and they see that and it leaves an influence on them. And they begin to say, well, you know, wow, they, they seem to be doing pretty good. They're always happy. They're smiling. They're enjoying themselves all the time. Even when they have difficult times, they're still smiling. And, uh, you know, what it is that they got? What are they doing? So they begin to be influenced by us and start living that way. Even if they don't become Christians, some of that is going to rub off on them. Okay. They're going to uh, see some of that. Now, let's just get a little bit more specific here. Let's take human life, the value of human life. The human life is, uh, had no very low value before the Christian influence took, camp, took place. Christian influence changed human, the value of human life significantly all over the known world when it, was, uh, when it came about. Before that, people were treated with little value. A person would take your property. They would take your life. Uh, they would disrespect you, they would denigrate you and put you down. And this was especially true with women. Women. Uh, women were considered lower class citizens. They were considered subservient. They were considered incompetent. This is how women were considered. And this is especially true in India, China, Rome, and Greece. Women were put down. They were looked down upon. The famous Greek uh, philosopher Aristotle said a woman was somewhere between uh, a slave and a free man. That's, a, that, that's how he would see a woman. So that tells you then that any way on that scale, any place on that scale where that woman was, she was considered less than a human being, less than what she was worth to be. Now, the, in, in India, for example, a woman didn't have any value at all. So her value was tied to her husband. Whatever the husband value is, that's all she's worth. When that husband died, they had a practice in India called sati, S-U-T-T-E-E, -E, and it means good woman. So when that husband died, when he was cremated, cremated, that woman would be cremated with her, with him. Whether she wanted to or not, whether she was in good health or not, didn't matter. She would be cremated right with her husband because she had no value. Her value is tied to the husband. She was a good woman. The term sati means good woman. So, and by the way, that practice is still going on somewhat, but it has subsided tremendously after the influence of Christianity. But you have a very similar practice to that in some parts of Africa. When that tribal chief dies, his wife and all of his concubines, and all the women that he had affairs with, all of them would be buried with him. Or if he was cremated, all of them would be cremated with him. That's how much value a woman had in those days. And down in India, that practice continued to go on until the gospel was, of Christianity was taken down to uh, India by uh, the Apostle Thomas. Thomas took the gospel down into India around the mid-first century, around 50-something A.D. And uh, when Thomas got the gospel down there, then the people start seeing how they start feeling guilty. The Christian influence began to take place, and millions of women are alive today because of what that gospel that went down there. Thomas was ultimately martyred down there. In fact, his, his tomb was down there in India today. But they also had a practice with women called sex, sex selection. This practice is still going on today, especially in, 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 uh, area, in certain areas, uh, certain Asian countries. Uh, they got sex selection going on where... Um, if a child was born and that child was male, that child would be allowed to live. If the child was female, that child would be disposed of. This was a brutal, awesome, terrible kind of way to live a life. Uh, they, they, they literally killed these, these babies, and it would made it even worse. They didn't have no sonograms to tell what the sex of the child before the child was born. They had to wait until after the child was born, then dispose of the child if the child was a female. Now, that's, you talk about barbaric. Here you have a, a, a living human being right before you, but because of the sex of that child, you say that child doesn't deserve to live, and you kill that child. That's called infanticide, literally killing. And by the way, some of that's going on right now today, even in our country today. 
even in our country. But this is what, what has been happening. But when the Christian influence came, a lot of these practices began to subside. Uh, even though the people didn't become Christians, they felt embarrassed about the barbaric behavior they had been practicing. So what they did was st stop doing it. They started pulling themselves back from doing it. And any place you see the gospel of Jesus Christ taught in the world today, you'll see less of these type practices. If you look at countries today where uh, Christianity is forbidden, of course, almost all countries will say they allow freedom of religion or they allow people to have religion. Most of them will tell you that. And you have Christians in all countries now, but they're suppressed. They're underground Christians. They have to hide. Okay. But let's just say uh, you look at countries where Christianity is suppressed or forbidden, outright forbidden. The, the women uh, can't do certain things. They can't, they, they can't get a driver's license. They can't leave home without uh, a man with them. This is some of our uh, Muslim brothers' countries, some of the Muslims. You can't, can't get a driver's license. You can't leave home unless you got a brother or a husband or uncle or, or some male figure with you. You can't get educated. They wouldn't let you go to school or anything. You have to have your face covered when you leave home. Call a burqa. Uh, so, and some of the, the sects of Islam, you have to have nothing but your eyes showing. Can't show anything else, only your eyes. But this is the kind of suppression that women had. And this is what goes on wherever Christianity is not taught in the world. This is what you see. This is the kind of thing that you see that's going on in, in, uh, around the world today. Also, elderly, the elderly people, they even treat the elderly bad. Um, when the people get old, this is like in, in, in going on now, like in China and Japan, and the people get older, the grandkids, you got a grand uh, grandkids or, or your kids or grandkids would take you out somewhere and put you out on a boat in the ocean and just leave you there. Or put you out in the cold area of the world and just leave you there where you just freeze to death. Um, some of that is going on in the United States. They don't just put you out in the ocean like that or put you out in, in, in a cold area. Uh, what they do today, even here in the United States, these kids would, a grandchild would take the grandparent or the elderly parent and take them to a mall or a parking lot where a lot of people are and just leave them there. I say, uh, Grandma, uh, I, I, I gotta, I'm gonna go over to the bathroom. I'll be right back. Or oh, Grandma, you sit right here. Uh, I'm going to uh, get you uh, uh, something to eat and I'll be, be right back. And they never come back. It's just, it, it, as we move further and further away from Christian teaching, this is exactly what we see and we're seeing more and more of it. Some estimates uh, of 100,000 cases every year right here in the United States. They got a term for it, they call it granny dumping. Granny dumping, it's becoming so prevalent now and it's called, they even coined the term for it, granny dumping. And they just leave the grandma or the, or the parent out, the elderly person, just leave them out there. But what happened when Christianity came along, that began to subside. If they listen, if they follow the laws of Christian, but as we get a further and further away from Christian influence, that's exactly what happened. And millions of people, millions of people have been saved or are alive today, especially the women I'm talking about right now. Uh, millions of them are alive today because of uh, Christian influence, what the Christian influence has done for the world. Now, uh, some of the kids, some of the people, um, they would take them to a nursing home and just leave them, put them in the nursing home and never go back to see them. Just leave them there. You know, they got food, they got uh, water, they got nursing care, they got a roof over the head. What's the, what's the need? I don't have to go see grandma. I don't have to see my elderly parent. They, you know, what's the use? They got everything they take care of. What they don't understand is we were made to be relational. We have a need for relations with each other. God designed us that way because his intent for us is to have a relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. And he starts us off by developing a family unit and, and having us to have a relationship with each other. And maybe you can reach out to each other outside of the family unit, our immediate family unit and help others as well. That's how we begin to relate to each other, learn to relate to each other. Now, I remember when I was a young boy, my friends and I used to uh, go to the store and we had to walk by this elderly lady's house to get to the store. And, um, 
each time we would walk by this lady's house, she would be sitting on the porch. And when she see us, she would call us. And we would go up there and we'd sit on the porch and, and she'd start talking. And she would talk and talk and she would, we could never get away. And she would do this all of the time. It got so bad where we used to try to she would go around through the woods to keep from passing her house on the way to the store because we just didn't want to sit there and just listen at her. We were like uh, 10, 11 years old. I guess she was around 80 or so. Um, but, um, you know, there, there was no connect. There were, we were generations apart. They, whatever she was talking about had no interest in us at all. And we certainly wasn't, didn't want to just sit there. We were young boys full of energy, ready to run to the store and run back and play baseball and that kind of thing. So uh, one day I asked my mother, I said, Mother, why did Mrs. So-and-so always call us and sit there and talk with us for hours on end, um, you know, every time we walked by the house? And my mother said, Tom, she is lonely and she needs someone to talk to. Well, I didn't quite understand all that right then, but uh, it stuck with me. And as I began studying the Bible, I realized that that's how God made us. He made us to be relational so that we can have uh, a relationship with each other, a relationship with him and with each other. He's teaching us. He's training us. In fact, everything we go through in life is being trained, prepared to live in eternity with God, everything, small and great. But he's training us in this, and that stuck with me. And I said, wow. And, and ever since I really understood that and understand that God is behind all this, that God is actually doing all of this, then I, I, I had a deeper respect and love for the elderly. And I could, I could, because I understand, and not just the elderly, even those who are not so old, but who live alone or who are alone and don't have anyone uh, who would, would be around them, uh, like uh, where we could have a good relationship. Where we could have a good relationship. Now, women were being, being uh, suppressed. They, that little, the value of life was very diminished until the Christian influence came about. The greater the Christian influence is in that culture or in that nature, um, the more value a woman has. Now, if you look at a Christian church today, uh, Pew Research did some did a survey several years ago, and uh, what they found out was that in the Christian church, women are three times more likely to be there than men. In other words, men are three times less likely to be in church than women. So that all Christian church, this is in, the, in both large segments of Christianity, the Protestants and the Catholics. So uh, the women are three times more likely. This is the Christian church. When you look at other religions, you look at the temple and the mosque of other religions, Buddha, Islam, Judaism, and so forth, it's just the opposite. Men are three times more likely or a greater percentage more likely to be in the mosque or in the temple than women. Now, they didn't come up with a reason why. Why you have more women in the Christian faith, but just the opposite in all the others? This is because Christianity is the only religion in the world that treat women as women should be treated. And where did we learn that from? Jesus Christ himself. He made it abundantly clear how women are to be treated in a variety of ways. When a woman was caught in the act of adultery, uh, the Jews wanted to stone that woman to death. And Jesus said, wait a minute. The first, any one of you without sin, you cast the first stone at her. Any one of you without sin, that's the first stone at her. They turned around and walked away because they know all of them had sin. Jesus told the woman, say, uh, they, they don't condemn you, and I haven't condemned you either. That's John 8, verses 1 through 11. He treated that woman with respect. There was a woman who was living a sinful lifestyle, and this woman was washing Jesus' feet with her tears, drying his feet with her hair, and the Pharisees say, if Jesus knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't have anything to do with her. Jesus said, wait a minute. Why do you trouble this woman? This woman has done something good for me. And I'll tell you right now, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what she has done will be told as a memorial to her. It's Matthew 26 and verse 13. So Jesus made it very clear. He kept women in high esteem. He lifted them up. 
Women has value. Women have value. Uh, not like we see it all over the world today. And what did he tell us men about our wives? Husbands, love your wives as Jesus loved the church. And this is the Apostle Paul writing in the, to the church of Ephesus. Husbands, love your wives as Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. He treated women as women are supposed to be treated. Christianity is the only religion that does this. And I sometimes I see people protesting or, or, or talking in a negative way about the Bible or about Christianity. They'll say things like, well, I can't deal with that Bible because they say a man is the head of the woman or a man is a uh, head of the household. A woman should listen to the man. I can't deal with that. What they don't understand is that's the way God designed it, and that's the only way it's going to work properly because Christianity is the only religion to treat women the way they should be treated. And if a husband, if a man is treating that woman with respect and love and dignity, and he's uplifting that woman and showering her with affections and gifts, certainly she's going to want to be up under him. She's going to want to be listened to him. This is exactly what Jesus is doing with us in the church. He loves the church. He started the church. So we are submissive to him. We are up under him and trusting him. And it's the same thing he's telling the woman to do for the husband. That's the only way it works. And, and this is the only religion there is that does this. Now, to those same people who says that kind of thing about the Bible, I can't go along with the, the Bible the way they talk about women and women is under the man and all of that. I have one thing to say to them. Go and try some of the other religions and report back to me in 30 days. And let's see how that works. And you'll see the value of a life of a woman. Let's move to another area here where Christianity has made a significant difference in the world. Health and medicine. Health and medicine and Christians have done so much in this area. It's just remarkable. And we've got millions of people living right now today because of what Christians have done in health and medicine. First of all, we are all required to live healthy lives. We're not we're supposed to take it. The body, Bible tells us this throughout. We're supposed to take care of our bodies. We're supposed to eat healthy, drink healthy. Uh, don't put use excessive alcohol and put tobacco into our bodies, uh, drugs into our bodies. We're supposed to uh, exercise and take good care of our bodies, the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we know this. We are taught this all, all, all the way through uh, both the Old and New Testament. Then Jesus taught that we are to help those who are hungry and to provide support for them and help them if they are sick and even pray for them when they are sick and so forth. So when this is what, what we as Christians have been taught and we as Christians know. And what about hospitals? Well, before Christianity, there was no hospitals. There were some little makeshift uh, tents or something like that uh, where people would treat some others. And the only people that were being treated were slaves and soldiers. That's all. They had to treat the, the slaves because uh, they had to treat the slaves because uh, they had to, we, we had to treat the slave because the slaves were the ones that were, Jack, you could take that down for a moment. You had to treat the slave because the slaves were the ones that uh, were carrying on uh, their, their affairs for them. The slaves were the ones that were taking good care of what they owned and what they had, helping them into it. So they would treat the slave. They would also treat the uh they would treat the slaves, they would treat the, the, the soldiers, those who fought for them, because the, those who fought for them would protect what they own. So they would treat those in the hospital. Other than that, nobody was being treated. So they did, and, and, and those were just a little makeshift hospitals. But true, real hospitals did not really come about until much later. And these hospitals were started by Christians. Hospitals were started by Christians. If you look at all of the hospitals today, then you will see uh, that uh, these hospitals have Christian names. If you look at the screen, you can see some of the names of the hospitals that they have Christian names because they were started by Christians. Uh, uh, Jagger has a slide there that she could show you that she just put up a moment ago. And you can look at these, some of these hospitals, St. Luke's Presbyterian Hospital. Just look at the Christian names that you have there. Holy Cross Hospital, Good Samaritan Hospital, St. Joseph Hospital, St. Francis Hospital, St. Luke, Mount Sinai. All of these are Christian hospitals 
started by Christians, because Christians were the ones that started the hospitals. And you got the, the Alms House. The Alms House was actually uh, the first hospital started in the United States. It wasn't, it wasn't called a hospital, it was called Alms House, and it was started by Quakers. There was a Quaker by the name of William Penn. Quakers is a, a religious organization that uh, uh, has its own little kind of, uh, a little bit unorthodox there, but it started in the 17th century. Uh, and and, and uh, you had some pretty popular Quakers. They were like, mm, Herbert Hoover was a Quaker. Uh, Richard Nix, Nixon was a Quaker. But that's where the first hospital was started. And these arm houses, when, the first, when this house started back in the 17th century, actually started in 1782 when it started. But when, it, when, it, when this one started, it was only started to treat Quakers. Quakers who were poor and unhealthy. And eventually it started treating anybody who needed help. But this is how the first hospital actually started. And this is when, uh, and you notice who's behind it, Christians. Now think about all the people that took advantage of hospitals are still going to hospitals today. The whole world, not just Christians. The whole world is benefiting. The whole world is blessed because of Christianity. That's what we're talking about here. The whole world is blessed because of what Christians have done. And God used Christians to bring these blessings to the world. And the people are going to these hospitals and they don't even know that Christians, the reason they, they are able to go to these hospitals is because of Christians. And what about nurses? You can't have a hospital without nurses. God used Christians to start the nursing profession. There was a lady by the name of Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale said that when she was 17, God was calling her to some kind of work, but she didn't know what it was until she got into her 30s. But she is credited with being the founder of the nursing profession that we know today. And this nursing profession has grown and evolved and prospered prospered so much until it's impossible to have a medical system without the nurses. These nurses, are, they can't even function, the doctors can't even function without nurses. In fact, you got uh, 10 nurses to every three doctors in the United States. You got over 3 million nurses in this country, and they are critically important. They, in fact, I, I dare say these nurses are more important than the doctors. Because you can't even get to the doctor. First of all, there's not enough doctors, but you can't even get to the doctors if you go and tell you those, those nurses to look at you first, a lot of them, unless you go into the emergency. And even then, you go into nurses. These nurses are always the first in the forefront of everything. When the pandemic hit, who was on the forefront? Nurses. Nurses. They were right there wearing their masks and everything. And some of them even contracted COVID 19 themselves. They, they're dedicated to their job and they do very hard work. And who started it? Christians. Jesus Christ started it. He used Christians to start the nursing profession, to start the hospitals. And many of the doctors are Christians. And it started things like the vaccine. Uh, you got people that started the pasteurization. Uh, you got all, every, pretty much every medical implement and procedure and process that you could think of today were started by Christian doctors. Every single one of them. I look at um, Dr. Ben Carson, the, the world-renowned neurosurgeon, with his uh, the work that he has done in, in, in separating brains and babies and that kind of thing. Amazing. The whole world is blessed because of this. The whole world is, is, is being taken care of because of this. Let's move to another area, education. Education. Now, the average person get educated, they figure, oh, yeah, you know, we, 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 uh, I'm not a Christian, but, you know, I got my doctor degree, master's degree, and all of that kind of thing. <laughs> there was a time when only the elite and would get educated because there were no Christian, there were no schools. There were no schools at all. If you were wealthy, you were elite, then you could get educated. If you did not have any money, and you weren't in the noble class, then you could not get educated. Well, in 1620, in this country, the Pilgrims landed in Plymouth, Massachusetts. They call it Plymouth, Massachusetts. Now it was called Plymouth Rock back then. But in 1620, they landed. By the time they got to the 1640s, they had an automatic uh, organized system of education already established. And they passed a law. What they said was that we have to teach the children to learn to read and write so that they can learn to read the Bible 
and not be deluded by Satan. So they passed a law in 1647 called the Old Deluder Satan Act. How's that a name for a law? Old Deluder Satan Act. And that act said the parents must provide money to pay teachers to teach the children. This was the beginning of the school system in this country. The parents must provide. We want the children to learn so that Satan will not get a foothold in their lives. We want them to read the Bible. Now imagine this. The schools, the educated system was started. The organized, educated, public education system was started to teach children how to read the Bible. That's what the whole purpose of getting educated, to learn how to read the Bible. That's why we go to school today. You would never believe it today, of course, but that's why it was started. It's the old and new to Satan that. And guess what the textbook was? The Bible. That was the Bible. And they, used, they took the Bible and, and took little statements out of it, little Bible stories out of it, Adam and Eve and um, Noah and the ark, and they would make little rhymes and teach the children how to read those rhymes out of those out of the Bible. At the same time, they were learning the biblical story behind it. But that's how the schools were started in the United States. That's why we got the public school system now. Started by whom? Started by Christians. The whole world benefits from that. The whole country is benefiting from that education. But it's not just the, uh, uh, the school, but it's also the colleges and universities. Colleges and universities were also started by Christians. If you uh, look at some of the colleges and universities, they have their, uh, the Christian names right now. Um, Jackie has a list there that she'll show you. Uh, if you look at some of the Christian names, uh, look at some of the, the colleges that were started by Christians. Oxford and Cambridge, and by the way, these are some of the older colleges in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the world, in the, certainly in the country. Um, you look at Oxford and Cambridge, Yale, Princeton. These are Ivy League colleges, New York University, Harvard University, William and Mary, Columbus University. All of these colleges were started by Christians, every single one of them. And now look at the one, uh, number five there, Harvard. Harvard was started by Reverend John Harvard. He was a pastor. He was a minister. And notice what he said, why he said he started it. He said he started it to teach and train ministers so that they wouldn't be illiterate to the word of God. That's why Harvard was started. Think William and Mary. William and Mary was created. And why? So that the Christian faith might be propagated. That's why they say they started, so that the Christian faith might continue on. Columbus University. Columbus University was started off as King's College, and it had an early advertisement on it. And here's what it said that in the advertisement. The chief thing that is aimed at in this college is to know God in Jesus Christ. How about that? These colleges were started by Christians to teach Christians about God and to teach them how to train other Christians. Go to the colleges now, any one of them. You would be surprised. You can't even mention Jesus' name. Christian students are belittled and besmirched and denigrated in these colleges and universities now. What they're teaching in the colleges and universities now is just the opposite of what the original intent was. But we shouldn't be too surprised at that. Because everything that we see now that's going on is the opposite of the original intent. And the educational system falls right into that, into that realm. It falls right into it. These colleges are, are anti-Christian, anti-biblical all the way. If the, the people who started these colleges could come back and see what, they have, what their institutions have become, they would be shocked. Literally shocked. But the whole world is blessed because of these uh, institutions that were started. Christianity started the educational system in this country. Let's go to another one. Charity and helping the poor. Charity and helping the poor. Christians done more and do more in donating to charity than any other. <coughs> uh, Jack, you can show that later on. Not yet. Christians do, do donate to charity. <coughs> Donate to charity more than any other organization on earth. We donate, we do this because Jesus taught us. He taught us to give. He taught us to uh, to help others. Before Christianity came about, before the Christian influence came about, um, people didn't help others very much. Charity was very low uh, and pretty much non existent. 
people then people would keep what they have. And if they if they had a little, they would definitely not give you a part of their little. They would not do that. It just wouldn't happen. You wouldn't get you wouldn't get a lot of help from us. But when the Christian influence came along, then Jesus taught us to give and to help the poor. And many billions of people have been helped because of this, uh, because of Christianity. Now, all religions, all religions have something in their code or in their doctrine. All world religions have something in their code or in their doctrine about giving and helping others. All religions got that. So all religious people, doesn't matter which one religion is, whether they're Jews or, or whether they're uh, Muslims or whatever, they give. But Christianity gives more than all other religions. Why? Because of Jesus Christ, of course. Every good thing, good and perfect come from him. We give more than any other religion in, in period. Because what did Jesus taught? He taught us. He said, where your heart is, where your money is, that's where your heart is. That's in Matthew 6, verses uh, 19 and 21 through 21. Now, we give, we know we should give, and we love to give. When a person, when a, a politician runs for, uh, say, president or for uh, public office, sometimes they make their tax returns uh, public, a matter of the public record. And when you look at those tax returns, you, may, you will be surprised to see how much these people give. Some of them, and I'm not talking about Christians, well, not even some Christians, but when you look at that schedule A on that return, you'll see that some of them give very little once that return is public. Then you'll look at the return the following year, and next year you'll see them giving more. That's because they know now the return is public, and they don't want people to see that they're not giving. Now they're being influenced by the public to give more. Well, that's how Christianity is. Christianity does influence people to give more. Iron shop and Zion, we are told uh, in, in, in Isaiah. But this is what happened. Now, people who don't believe in God, people who are not Christians, give hardly anything or, or don't give anything, if anything at all. These are people who are atheists or agnostics or people who are indifferent. They very seldom give anything at all. Now, this fits right in with their worldview, so we, can't, we shouldn't be too surprised at this because here's how they think. Well, here's the mindset. Um, this is the only life there is. There's no hair after. So I'm going to get everything I can, keep everything I got, eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow I die. So why should I give myself to you? It's all about me, me, me. This is my only life. After this, this is it. So I'm going to live. I'm going to get anything that would make me happy. I'm sorry about you. That's the mindset they have. So they don't give. And by the way, this is borne out in, in their tax returns. You can see people who uh, don't believe in God or people who are atheists. They, you can see that they don't give. They just don't. And the closer you see people are to Christ, you see usually the more they are willing to give. That's because the Holy Spirit who regenerates us and gives us that giving spirit and we want to give and we love to give and we know more blessed to give. We know we are pleasing Jesus Christ when we give. So we give and we give and we give. And that's one of the things that we've noticed about Faith Outreach Community Church. We have a lot of people there who just give and give. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is leading them to do that. It is God living within us who, give, who helps us to give. It's the way we live our lives. And other people see, and other people begin to give as well. But Christians don't just give to their particular church. Christians give to other organizations. Christians uh, give to nonprofit organizations and charitable organizations. Christians also give it their time. They don't just give their treasure. They give their talent and their time as well. There are Christians that started uh, a charitable organization like the YMCA and the YWCA and uh, the Salvation Army started by William Booth in England. You know, he was a Christian. He started this to help the homeless and the drunken. You know, so these are these are Christians uh, who started these things and who are giving and who's helping the world in that way. And you think... Thousands of Christians uh, just give all the time. And if you, you look at uh, the names of some of these organizations uh, that uh, you see to have Christian names, these charitable organizations, and Jackie has a, or a list up there. You, you see these organizations um, with the name, with Christian names on them. Uh, our Daily, look, notice the Christian names, now, Our Daily Bread, <laughs> Our Daily Bread Food Bank, 
Providence House. Providence is a Christian term. Christian terminology. Covenant. No, but we talk about a covenant. Covenant. Christian Children Relief Fund. Compassion. Where do you get compassion from? Jesus Christ is full compassion in the name. World vision. Without vision, the people perish. He has a world vision. Vision here. Samaritan's Press. Wow, Franklin Graham. Samaritan's Press is one of the is, is to me one of the most impressive uh, charitable organizations out there. Um, that Franklin had done a tremendous job with this. These people are on the ground whenever the a disaster hit. Uh, with Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Andrew and uh, uh, the Haitian earthquake and any other disaster that come about, uh, floods and so forth, they're there, not just in the United States, all over the world. They're there, they're giving, and, they're, they, and these, these organizations are very well organized, these charitable organizations. Started by Jesus Christ. Jesus, how did Jesus start it? Use Christians, use his Christian followers to bless the whole world. And millions of people are alive today because of these organizations. They've been blessed by them. And, and, and God continues to bless them. I was at an apologetic conference about five years ago, and there was someone there from Samaritan's Purse, or one of the other Christian charitable organizations, and got into a long conversation with this man. And he was explaining to me how organize, how they organized to give when they have that disaster, from the time they have that disaster hitting and from the time they hit the ground to help, how they got it organized step by step. It's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, they really have this, this thing together. And you can see God hand all in it, all through it. And, they, and they, they're working with volunteers. These volunteers come in and they hit the ground running, man. And they keep families living and keep them in, in good health. And they have Christian doctors that volunteer, uh, and Christian nurses that volunteer, just blessing people. And they don't stop to ask whether you're a Christian or not. The whole world, they're blessing everybody. The whole world is being blessed because of Christianity. The whole world is. So, so this is one of the other things that we have here. Now then, when we look at all of these, we look at... Uh, and we just to summarize these, you know, just to get a little idea of what's going on. We see that women are being treated better because of Christianity. Okay, the, the value of human life has grown significantly. We've seen people are living longer, they're living healthier uh, because of uh, uh, medical care, medicine, health and medicine. Uh, Jack, you could throw the last slide up. The, the health and medicine that. Uh, Start all this started by Christians as well. You can see that people are getting better educated now. People are getting educated because Christians started the educating education institutions in the country and even around the world. Actually, we didn't mention this. We call it back to the 300 BC. And so there was followers of God who started that. You know, remember all good and perfect things come from God. That's the bottom line here. You know, people just don't realize it. A lot of Christians don't. But if you want to talk about defending the Christian faith, you could that, always let people know you they're being blessed and living in comfort and getting health care and getting education and driving a car and getting married and anything else that's good that's happened to them is because of God. It's coming from God. Any way you look at it. And, but these are areas where we could point them to right we can actually see going on charity and helping the poor, all that money from those charitable organizations that, that we donated, not just money again, but time, talent, and the treasure, and the money itself, donating and giving to human beings, and they're just, uh, people are living, their children are living, their grandchildren are living, you come right on down the line. But that first one there, the value of human life, that is, uh, 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 without life, you got nothing else. You can't do anything else. So that's a big one. That is big. And that's why we address that one first, because the human life meant nothing until Christ came in and uh, and started the Christian faith and the Christianity began to influence people all over the world. Even those who did not become Christians were still influenced by Christianity and they felt bad about the way they were living and treating uh, other people. So they began to change. It's amazing how we can influence others. A lot of times we don't even realize and don't even know it. But we have a whole lot that we could tell the whole world about what Christianity has done, what Christianity is doing, and uh, how they are being blessed by Christians. So if they got an indifferent attitude or they got a nonchalant attitude uh, toward Christianity, then uh, they need to stop and think about what Christianity has done for them. 
because Christianity has done more for them than they could ever imagine, than they ever knew. They don't think about it. In fact, Christians don't even think. A lot of times we don't even think about it. But we are doing it and helping others because of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the one that taught us how to do these things and got all these things started to bless the entire world, to bless the whole world. And the whole world is blessed. And when we, again, when we talk about the value of human life, you got millions and millions of women that are living today because of this, but not just women, men also. We focus on women because they were the ones that were persecuted most. Now, some of this stuff is still going on. Yes, some of the uh, atrocities are still taking place, but not even a fraction of, it's just a small fraction of what would have been happening if Satan, if God had not come in and put the Christian influence there and block Satan from what he's trying to do in terms of killing everything, every steal, kill, and destroy. So the Christian influence has been tremendous and overwhelming uh, to everybody. Now, this is part one of a sermon that we, that we are bringing to you. We will bring another part to you um, in a future lesson, in a future sermon. Uh, it'll be part two. And uh, we'll show you some other areas where Christianity has been a blessing and is indeed a blessing to everybody in the world, not just Christians, but to the whole world, the whole world. All the families of the earth will be blessed, Jesus uh, told uh, Abraham. And that came right on down through Jesus Christ. So all the families of the world is being blessed. So we, we uh, will talk more about some of these other areas the next time uh, we speak on the subject and it'll be at some sermon in the future we don't want to say exactly when we're not sure when with everything going on here but we will be coming to you with more of this information and hopefully you could take this information and use it uh to bring uh glory to god and uh and, and let your family and your friends and your relatives and all those who know what christianity really is doing what christianity is really about it's not just about not only about being saved and going to heaven no, no, we are here to have life and have it more abundantly and to help others. We can know God and make him known, and to make him known is to help bring others to Jesus Christ. And this is what we do as followers of Jesus Christ. So you can always let the people know this. So let us uh, close then with prayer. And if you'll bow your heads with me, please. Father in heaven, we are thankful that you've blessed us, that we can go through these different areas uh, that you have established to serve the world, to give the world more comfort, to give the world more, uh, more support, to get them educated and to uh, give them better health and to uh, have them value life and give them a way to live. And we're just so thankful that you taught us this, that we can let them know and they can see the glory of God in all of these things. We just thank you so much for teaching us this, Lord, and having us to bring it out to others. And we just ask you to help us to use this knowledge and information to, to just glorify you, Lord, and to make our lives better. Uh, we could be better instruments in your hands that you will use to glorify yourself and be a blessing to others. So we just thank you for it, Lord, and just ask that you will help us inculcate it into our very being and make it a part of our being and to use it as we go to and fro in the world. So we just thank you once again, and we just ask your continued blessings on us as we move on into the balance of this week, a new week that's coming up. We ask that you will please protect all of us, keep us safe, Lord, help us to enjoy, and uh, just help us to do more than anything else, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. So my beloved brethren, we thank you again for being with us. We thank you that we are able to have these uh, sermons uh, and all of you on social media platforms. We are so grateful that God provided us with that means as well, where we can continue to communicate. So uh, we ask that you will just be careful, take care of yourselves and uh, whatever you do, more than anything else in the world, just keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and everything you think, do and say, protect yourselves and your families. And we look forward to seeing you again next Sunday. God bless. God bless. Thank you, Pastor Tom. Great word, man. Great thank, word. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mary. How you doing? Hi. How y'all doing? How you doing, Mary? How you doing, Mary? Come on. Is that Miss Vera?